Right. So welcome everybody to Winter Gardening and Overwintering Crops. Um, I'm Dean Gunderson, the Director of Education here at Seed St. Louis. So first, uh, definitions. Um, because winter gardening and then overwintering crops are a little bit different from each other. Um, so just to kind of distinguish what those differences are. Um, so with winter gardening, that is where um, you're planting crops in the fall in order to harvest them in the winter. So that's what I mean when we're talking about winter crops. So it's very similar to fall gardening, but uh, you generally need greater frost protection and a few changes in, in crops. There's some crops that do better as winter gardening or a little bit harder to do as winter gardening um, than fall. But if you came to the fall gardening class, um, there's gonna be a little bit of overlap here at the beginning because it's a lot, there's a lot of similarities. Um, and then overwintering crops is a bit different. So overwintering crops are plants that you are planting in the fall, usually pretty late fall, like mid-October. Uh, in order to get them established, they then stay alive all winter. And then they do most of their growing in late winter, early spring, and you're harvesting them uh, in, in early spring, really before any spring planted stuff would be ready. So it's stuff that you're planting in the fall in order to harvest in the early spring when you normally wouldn't have anything in the garden. So that's what overwintering crops are. Um, and this is the gardening season that is changing the fastest and is having kind of the most um, uh, most new things that are possible to grow um, or maybe things that uh, you, you haven't considered before um, because our winters are getting significantly warmer. Uh, and so there are more things like um, overwintering brassicas, which we're gonna talk about, which traditionally only grew in places like England and the Pacific Northwest that we've actually had pretty good luck growing in the city the last couple of years. Um, so winter gardening, I'm going to go into at the end, um, and that's one that is that is changing, and we're kind of experimenting with new things every year in hopes of finding new crops to grow in that in that window. So why, you know, like um, if you talk to a lot of like uh, like vegetable farmers and stuff, they are not interested in winter gardening because they are tired, and a lot of gardeners are tired in the winter. And so one of the questions is like, why would you want to do this? Like, why would you want to be gardening in the winter. Um, and there's a couple of reasons. So one is that the fall and kind of early winter here is really a much more predictable cool season than the spring is in St. Louis. You know, our springs can be very erratic. Like this spring, um, it, was, it was really warm in early spring and then it got really cool um, and stayed cool into like, you know, almost the end of May, at which point it was 95 degrees. Um, and that's, you know, and that's weird. And then there's other times where it'll be cool. And then in mid-April, it'll get really hot. And it's just hard to know, which can make it hard to know exactly what spring crop is going to do well. Whereas in the fall, it's, it's a little bit more predictable. You know, you know, it's going to be hot, it's going to cool down at some point, and then it's usually going to stay pretty cool. Um, once you get into the fall, early winter. And then the same with these overwintering crops. We don't necessarily know how cold it's gonna get, but we know it's gonna be cool. It's not gonna be 95 degrees in January, or at least I sure hope that's not gonna start happening. Um, and, so, and so it just makes it a little bit more predictable. <clears throat> also, if like the, the taste difference between things that you're growing like in the spring versus in the fall, winter, uh, they actually, the fall, winter ones tend to be a little sweeter because the, the freeze, kind of the frosts that you get um, as they're maturing actually breaks down some of the starches and turns them into sugars. And so they're, they're like literally sweeter, um, which is nice. Versus in the spring, you know, if we get an unpredictably warm spell, they get bitter and tough. Versus in the fall, if we get an unpredictably cold spell, they become sweet and tender. And I'll take sweet and tender over tough and bitter any day. There also tends to be fewer weeds. Um, because it's getting colder and the days are getting shorter. So there's just less weeds to deal with. There's also fewer pests. Um, and this is particularly the case with overwintering crops, way fewer weeds, way fewer pests. Uh, and you usually don't need to water, or if you are watering, it's, it's you know, much less than if you're trying to grow things in June um, for these cool season crops, because it's generally pretty rainy and it's again, cooler. And so you're just not getting as much um, drying out happening. Uh, and then the big one is just, you can get food from your garden when it's really hard to get local produce. Um, you know, like, like there's, there's not that many farmer's markets in January and February that you can get vegetables at, um, but you can grow them in your garden. 
which is what we're going to talk about. So first, um, and this is again, if you've come to our fall gardening class, you've seen this chart, um, but kind of defining what cold is. So, um, you know, especially when we're wanting to harvest things in the winter, kind of knowing a little bit more about cold and frosts is, is pretty important. So first is frost danger. So um, a lot of you have probably heard, you know, people talk about like the first frost date in the fall. Uh, and that's usually given as like a date of like, oh, the first frost date is October 15th or whatever. And, you know, a lot of times we think like, oh, that means there's going to be a frost like then, but that's not actually what that means because weather isn't predictable in that way. Um, what those frost dates are, is they're a statistical analysis of past, past year's freezes. So, you know, a 10% a frost day, which is not usually what people use, but sometimes they, they will. Um, in St. Louis, the 10% frost day is October 10th. And what that means is that, you know, one out of every 10 years on average, has a frost on or before October 10th. Um, the 50% frost day is usually what people will give you. Um, and that's, you know, October 27th in St. Louis. And what that means is that by October 27th, there's a 50-50 chance that there will have been a frost in any given year. And then the 90% frost day, which is like, you're gonna have a frost generally is, is Veterans Day. So, um, you know, by Veterans Day, there's a 90% chance that there will have been a frost in St. Louis any given year. So that's all those numbers give you. They're not certainties. They're not guarantees. Uh, it's just a way to kind of figure out what are the chances of there being a frost. And there's also different types of frost. So there's, um, so there's light frosts. So a light frost is, is really, you know, it, it got below freezing, but just barely. So generally a light frost is where you're going to see, you know, where it's going to be above freezing and then, you know, just for maybe an hour or two at night, it's going to dip below freezing, you know, kind of in that, like, you know, right before the sun comes up, it's going to, you know, in the coldest part of the night, it'll get below freezing for just a, a little bit. That's generally what you see with light frosts. And that's usually what you see for the first frost, the first couple frosts of the year. So that's where, you know, you get temperatures between like 28 and 32 degrees Fahrenheit. At those temperatures, all of your summer stuff is going gonna, is gonna to get roasted. Um, your summer stuff cannot handle any frost which is what makes them summer crops. <clears throat> but there are, you know, all cool season crops can handle a light frost. Um, that's what makes them cool season crops is that they can handle at least some frost. Uh, there are some cool season crops that can only handle a light frost, not many, but a few that can only handle a light frost. Um, so those are gonna die if we have a hard frost. So a hard frost is anything below 28 degrees would be considered a hard frost. So most things, uh, most cool season things can handle a hard frost. And then there's a killing frost, which is anything below 10 degrees. And, you know, without protection, um, a killing frost is going to kill almost anything. Um, there's a few vegetables that can handle killing frosts, but not many. So just to give you a um, kind of a basic idea here of what those frost tolerances are, the, um, the semi-hardy crops, so things that can only tolerate a light frost, are things like beets, carrots, chard, lettuce, and turnips. Um, and when I say these, it doesn't necessarily, like carrots, for example, can take a harder frost, uh, but the greens die, like the leaves will die, um, and then the roots are more, more prone to rotting. Um, and that's kind of the case like with beets as well. Like if you get, you know, to 27 degrees, the leaves are gonna get pretty pretty banged up. The root might not be damaged, but it's probably best to kind of dig them up at that point, just so that the roots aren't gonna rot because they're not really actively growing at that point. Uh, and then like hardy crops, so things that can handle a hard frost would be all of your brassicas. So broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, collards, kale, kohlrabi, um, things like mustard, onions, parsley, uh, peas, radishes, spinach, turnip greens. So um, I'm talking about varieties that are specifically turnip greens. So the leaves of turnip roots um, will die in a hard frost. But if you're growing a turnip green variety like um, like seven top, which is which like the root is not good, like you don't want to eat a seven top turnip root. Um, those leaves are particularly cold hardy, like one of the most cold hardy crops that you can grow. Um, it's just weird that they are that much difference in hardiness, but they are. 
Uh, and then mosh, which is a crop that most people haven't heard of, but I'll talk about it a little bit later. And then arugula. But when we're talking about, um, you know, getting crops through winter or having them alive in winter so that we can harvest them, uh, it's not just like the air temperature that matters, which is what, like when you see like, what's the temperature outside? That's just measuring air temperature. There's other things that have an impact on that. One is ground temperature. So um, a frost in the fall is usually gonna be less damaging to a plant than a frost in February because the ground is warmer in the fall than it is in the spring. And that warmth from the ground, the, the, when the air temperature is lower than the ground temperature, that heat is radiating up from the ground during that frost. And so the plants that are really short um, are actually gonna stay quite a bit warmer than, than something that's way up tall, like way up high, just because the ground temperature is higher. Humidity also plays a role. So humid air holds more heat better, as I'm sure we all know, living in St. Louis. You know, you know, hot air is one thing, hot humid air is a whole nother beast. It's much hotter. Um, it feels much hotter. And that's because it, it literally holds more heat. Um, and that's the same in the winter as well. You know, usually uh, winter air is pretty dry, but if it's humid, you know, if there was just a rain um, and then it gets cold, it's, you know, the plants are not gonna be as damaged by the same air temperature as if it was dry leading up to um, a freeze of the same technical air temperature. Um, and then like it says here, it also reduces frost's drying effects. So that like when plants freeze, it also dries them out or when the air is, is frozen. And so if it's more humid, it's gonna help protect them from that. And then air movement is another thing. Um, if it's a very still air at night, like if it's, if it's not windy at all, that heat radiating up from the ground is gonna keep those plants warmer versus if it's windy, that, that wind is just gonna blow that heat around and it's not gonna be really any warmer. And then microclimate. So if you are in like a low spot, if your garden's in a low spot, those plants are actually gonna get colder than if they were up on a high spot. Um, if you have a, a slope, like if you have a south facing slope where the sun um, is gonna hit that land more directly in the winter than, than flat land, that ground is actually gonna be warmer than, than flat ground. And so kind of these different microclimates can also impact um, how hardy your plants are. And then another really important thing about trying to garden uh, in this time of year is the sun. You know, often we think about, you know, again, it, oh, it's cold in the winter. Well, why is it cold in the winter? The main reason is the sun. <laughs> there's, there's less sun. The days are shorter. The sun is less intense. There's less heat coming in um, to our location. And that, and you also have to remember that that light, you know, for us, heat is the main thing that we think about, but it's also for plants, it's, it's food. Like it, it's what they're eating. You know, they photosynthesize. I mean, it's, not that that simple, but uh, the light coming in and hitting their leaves is how they photosynthesize. It's how they produce carbohydrates. And so in the winter, when the days are really short and the sun is very, um, is very diffuse, the plants can't really grow very well. And so there's this concept called the Persephone days, which is the point at which um, the day length is shorter than 10 hours. So this is you know, only in the winter time. Uh, in St. Louis. And when the day length is less than 10 hours, generally speaking, plants really aren't growing. Um, they might be growing just a little bit, but it's not usually perceptive. Like you can't usually perceive how quickly they're growing because it's happening so slowly. And so during this period, which is from November 18th to January 23rd, it doesn't really matter how warm your plants are. They're just not really going to grow. Um, they're really using the little bit of energy they have just to kind of maintain themselves, to kind of keep themselves alive, to keep themselves going through winter in hopes that when the days get longer and it gets warmer, they can start growing again. Or in your case, keep them alive so that when January comes and you want some cabbage, you can eat it. So what does this all mean? So what this means is that in order to harvest in the winter, most plants will need to have some cold protection. Um, it's cold, you know, like I said, a killing frost is below 10 degrees. I don't know that there's really ever been a winter where it didn't get below 10 degrees at least once. And so, you know, if you want your plants to stay alive, they're gonna need at least some winter protection. Um, if you 
if, if you want to, to harvest them all winter long. You know, usually it's the coldest kind of in January, February. If you're only wanting to keep stuff till December, maybe you don't need to cover it. But we'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit later. But if you're wanting to grow stuff truly all winter long for winter gardening, you're going to need some kind of cold protection. And then also because of the light issue, the Persephone Day kind of concept, plants will have to be grown before winter comes in order to have your crops mature and ready to go to harvest in the winter. And so the general kind of number that's given is that you want your plants to be at least 75% of the way to maturity by the start of the Persephone days. So, you know, by November 18th, your plant should be at least 75% of the way to harvest because like I said, they'll grow a little bit, but not a whole lot. And so, and so that's where kind of the overlap between fall and winter gardening comes because you're really kind of growing them almost like you would a fall crop, but then you're just covering them and keeping them alive until you want to harvest them later in winter. And so you can use our, our planting calendar. Um, so this is, this is geared toward fall gardening, not winter gardening, these numbers. But generally speaking, you're going to be planting at the same time. So for winter gardening, uh, you know, like for up here for beets, for example, you know, it shows, oh, plant at the first half of August. Um, so what I would, you know, recommend for, for winter gardening is like, mid-August, like, like do it at the end of kind of that window, or even, you know, a couple of weeks later. There's, there's a little bit of flexibility, um, but kind of still in that same general range, but you can do, you know, a couple of weeks after uh, for, for winter gardening, because they don't need to be all the way to maturity by the time that that, that that period comes. They just need to be almost all the way there. Uh, and this, and this planting calendar, um, if, if you don't already have it, it's up on our website, seedstl.org. Um, it's just up on the, on the homepage. You can download it. You can do whatever you want with it. It's, uh, it's pretty helpful. So then what to plant, you know, what, what to grow in a winter garden. Uh, so, you know, cool season crops. You're not going to be growing tomatoes in a winter garden unless you have like a heated greenhouse with LED lights. Um, but, you know, cool season crops. And so for the most part, everything that you grew in the spring, you can grow again as a winter crop with a couple exceptions. One is bulb onions. Um, you can't grow big bulb onions in the fall uh, unless there's some crazy new breeding program that's accomplished this. Um, the, the, the kind of trigger that makes the, the onions produce those bulbs is a, is a change in day length and the day length is going in the wrong direction in the fall. And so it doesn't, it doesn't get that trigger. And so you're not gonna get a bulb on an onion. You can grow onions though, like green onions grow great in the fall and the winter, um, but you're not gonna get a big bulb onion. Peas is another one that uh, it's just probably not gonna happen. You could maybe do it in the fall garden, um, but you're not really gonna be getting that in the winter garden because the pr producing the pods requires a lot of energy. It's, it's a fruit technically, like it's a fruiting body of the plant, which requires a lot of energy to produce. And, you know, if they're maturing in no November, there's just not really enough light for them to be producing those things for the most part. Potatoes are another one. You could potentially grow potatoes and then have them in the ground, um, but you're not gonna, um, but you're, you're probably not gonna, you know, grow them and then harvest them in, in January from like green living plants. It's just probably not gonna work. Although if you experiment and find a way, let me know. Oh, um, and with the, the peas, um, I do always like to point out that although getting the pea pods is pretty difficult in a winter garden, pea shoots is one of my absolute favorite winter crops. Uh, the like, just the green growing tips of the plant um, are really good, which is what this picture is here. You know, you can see here where I harvested just that top, you know, four to six inches um, or so. They're, they're tender. They taste just like peas. They're great winter salad food. Um, and, they, and they sail through the winter just fine. The, the green things, they just aren't usually going to produce pods. So those are the things not to, uh, that aren't really going to do well. So some of the things that do especially well in the winter garden is really all brassicas do great. Um, especially heading brassicas can be really nice to grow in the winter garden. So things like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, uh, Brussels sprouts do well. Again, 
assuming that you grow them and they really kind of start forming the head before you get to those Persephone days. Because they can, those heading brassicas are interesting because they can actually kind of, it sounds bad, but kind of like cannibalize themselves to form the head. Um, like I've grown broccoli and harvested broccoli all the way up through like MLK day. And it just kept producing the shoots, which like leaves, they, they didn't produce any new leaves. They were just kind of like eating the, the resources that they already had uh, to keep pumping those out uh, Caraflex cabbage is another one like that's the cabbage that we uh, that we grow we grow it just as like a normal spring cabbage and a fall cabbage but it is also proved to be remarkably winter hardy um, like really really tough winter crop arugula is another one great um, winter crop because the in the spring arugula can be hard because it likes to bolt it doesn't like those hot temperatures so grow it in the fall um, and because they mature pretty quickly they can um, uh, um, sorry, because you, because they mature so quickly, you can plant them them later. So you can plant them into like September or even potentially October, um, which is which is nice. Um, same thing with spinach. You know, spinach can be hard to do in the spring because it likes to bolt when it gets hot. Whereas if you're growing it in the fall, it's much more resistant to that. Um, there's a couple different spinach varieties that are that are bloom like called Bloomsdale. Like there's one I think just called Bloomsdale, and there's one that's like improved Bloomsdale, and there's one that's called Winter Bloomsdale. Like there's there's several different Bloomsdale, um, and they all seem to be really winter hardy um, as well. So if you're looking for a spinach, those are particularly tough um, spinaches that are good. Um, like I said, turnip greens are one of the hardiest crops that there is for the winter, um, in my experience, and that's specifically seven top. Um, turnip, which is an old southern variety, which is why it's, again, a little surprising that it's so winter hardy. Mosh is another one that is uh, not very common here in the U.S., um, but it's a, um, it's a popular green in France um, and probably some other European countries, but I know France. Um, it's also called corn salad sometimes, which is a, a relic of the fact that um, corn used to be a, a word just for grain until in American English we changed the name of maize to corn for some reason. Um, but, and so we usually call it mosh because corn salad is confusing to, <laughs> in American English, but it's the, it's the same plant. Um, it's a really short little um, green. Uh, it is probably the hardiest um, winter crop that you can grow. So uh, that's another one to kind of look into if you're really interested in winter crops. Carrots are another one that I know earlier I said, um, you know, they're only hardy of light frosts, but if you get them dormant and you mulch them really heavily and you have decent drainage, the, the roots will stay on the ground all winter long. And like a late winter, early spring carrot is the sweetest, most tender carrot you will ever eat in your life. They are so good. Um, this is one that I pulled out. Um, this was in, a, was in a low tunnel. And so the greens are still alive, although a little, little ragged. They're so good. Uh, and then pea shoots, um, like I talked about a little bit ago, uh, Austrian winter pea is probably the easiest one to find that is that is hardy um, to get shoots. You know, if you just grow like uh, like a sugar snap pea, um, those aren't going to be as hardy as as one like um, Austrian winter pea, which is commonly sold as a as a cover crop. Uh, Asian greens also do really well. So things like bok choy, um, tat soy in particular is one that's really good. Um, and then leeks do pretty well in the winter as well. <clears throat> and then there are also some crops that, um, so it says only in the fall. So it was saying, you know, mostly it's stuff that you, that you grow um, in the spring, but these are some varieties that you really only can grow as fall crops or winter crops. Um, they, don't, they don't do as well in the spring. Um, and these are usually called winter varieties. Like it'll be called like winter beet or winter radish or winter cabbage or, win you know, winter kohlrabi. And these are varieties of cool season crops that were bred specifically to grow in the fall in order to have a long storage life. So these were the crops that our ancestors bred to, um, to you know, stick in the root cellar or to leave in the ground and mulch really heavily so that they had vegetables over the winter so that they didn't die of scurvy and all their teeth fall out. Uh, so like these, like these are the varieties that were bred to keep people alive through, through winter. <clears throat> I mean, amongst other things as well, but, um, but these are the ones that kind of still exist. So there's a winter beet called Lutz Greenleaf. Um, so this is just a nice big beet, like they can get real big. Um, so a lot of these, they tend to be big, uh, which helps with storage. 
um, because there's you know a lot more volume given the surface area um, they don't they don't dry out as quickly which is the main way that you know vegetables go bad they get kind of soft and squishy which is which is drying out uh, so let's uh, let's green leaf beet is a good one uh, winter radishes are some of my favorite winter crops um, Chinese white winter radish is probably the one that I like the most and that I've had the most consistent luck with. Um, but Chinese rose, winter radish, um, Spanish black, and then um, all daikon radishes um, do pretty well as, as winter crops. There's also some cabbages. So these winter cabbages are like true winter crops and that they were bred to, to grow to maturity and then just sit in the ground in the winter so that you can harvest them all winter long. So like January King is called that because you harvested in January. That was what it was bred to do. Uh, there's also one called Winter King Savoy. Um, uh, there's one called Omskirk and there's one called Dead On Savoy. Um, and all four of those have done pretty well for us as, as winter cabbages. They hold really well in the garden over, um, over the winter. Um, and then winter kohlrabi, which is just like any other kohlrabi, except the, 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 the bulbs or whatever you want to call it on them, uh, get much bigger, like softball size, um, and are still tender inside, which is, again, pretty nice. <clears throat> and then there are um, overwintering brassicas. So the overwintering brassicas are kind of a special group of crops here in St. Louis. Um, because we're still just a little too cold. So these would, so these would be true overwintering crops um, if we were a little warmer. Uh, but because we're still just a little cold, um, they are overwintering crops and that you plant them in the fall and you harvest them in the spring. So not like the winter crops that we've just talked about, but that um, you know, you're not harvesting in the winter, you're harvesting in them in the spring, but they do still need some protection over the winter because we're just a little too cold for them. But with a little bit of protection, like you would with your winter crops, you'll get these, um, these crops in order to harvest them in April, months before you'd be able to harvest them if you planted them in the spring. <clears throat> so you plant them at the same time as your winter brassicas. So if you're wanting to grow you know, your winter cabbage that um, you wanna harvest in January, you're gonna be planting these, uh, these, winter bra these overwintering brassicas like sprouting broccoli and winter cauliflower at the same time, but they are gonna produce, uh, produce later on. So sprouting broccoli produces a large amount of little broccolini. So this is a picture um, of one right here that we grew. So you can see, you know, it's not a big broccoli head. It's a lot of smaller heads um, that you'll get, but you're getting them in like mid April all the way into May, which is again, really early. Like usually you'd, you'd be planting like seedlings of broccoli in late March, you know? So, um, so getting, you know, mature broccolis in like mid April is really, really early. And so, um, so that's a good one. And then winter cauliflower is the other one that we've just started experimenting with the last couple of years. Um, and this is one that will produce just a classic cauliflower head, like grocery store cauliflower, you know, nothing weird or strange or unique about it, um, but it produces them from late April into May, which again, usually if you're planting like spring cauliflower, you're harvesting it in like June, like mid to late June, at which point it's usually really hot, which is one of the reasons why it's so hard to grow spring cauliflower. But it's a great way to get cauliflower. And these are also really nice because this is a time of year where even if you have stuff in the garden, it's, it's greens. For the most part, and so you can get these, you know, pretty more, you know, like substantial vegetables, um, really early in the year, which which can be very nice. So cold protection. So like I said, all of those winter crops and then the overwintering brassicas are going to need cold protection, but um, it depends on what you are growing and how late you want crops. Um, will determine kind of what level of crop of of cold protection that you need to give your crops. So just as an example, if you're growing, you know, cold hardy spinach, turnip greens, and collards, which are all really cold hardy crops, and you only want to be able to harvest them until, you know, like Christmas time, then you maybe don't need to do cold protection. You know, this, this picture over here, like this bed, I mean, they, they look a little sad, but they cook great. They're still good. This is turnip greens here on the right, and this is spinach over here on the left. This is like right before Christmas. And so, 
if that's really your goal is like just to get through Christmas and you're growing things that are particularly cold hardy, you might not need to worry about cold protection. But if you're wanting to have carrots or cabbage in February, um, you're, you're gonna need cold protection in order to do that. Uh, and you can see back here, you know, in the same picture, uh, you know, we, we were going through the same thing. So these crops didn't need protection, so we didn't do it. These things back here, so this bed directly back is, um, is carrots in half of it, and then sprouting broccoli with pea shoots underneath it on the other half of the bed. So it's covered because those things need, need winter protection. And so again, kind of depends on, on what your goals are, um, if you need cold protection and how much cold protection. But we're gonna talk about the different options that you have. So the first option, the easiest, um, simplest one is, is mulch. Um, I love mulch. I think people should have mulch on all their beds all the time. But um, what that is, is it's two to six inches of plant matter. And I know six inches sounds like a lot, um, but if your plants are, you know, nice and big, six inches is not really a problem. And that is, you know, any plant material. So my favorite, especially if you're talking about winter gardening, is all those leaves that fell in your yard that you either chopped up or you raked up. Save them for your garden. They make the best mulch. Um, and just put, you know, again, two to six inches on that bed. And that's going to act as like an insulation blanket over your soil. Because again, your soil is warm at this point. So it's going to help um, keep it warmer as the temperatures are fluctuating throughout, throughout winter and helps to moderate those swings that can happen. And so in terms of what to mulch, uh, everything, anything that you want to survive the winter, um, it's going to be beneficial to mulch, but especially, uh, like it says, anything that you want to survive through the winter um, and all root crops should be mulched um, because the, the freezing and thawing of the, usually the tops of roots kind of stick up out of the ground. Um, it can damage those and then that can open it up for rot and you can lose, you know, a whole, a whole root, which is a bummer. So, <clears throat> so mulch is great, um, but especially if you're wanting things to again, survive all winter in your winter gardening, uh, you're going to want something over top to kind of hold in the heat, similar to what a greenhouse does. <sighs> Excuse me. So a low tunnel is just a, uh, you know, structure that consists of a heat trapping fabric or plastic that is laid over hoops that hold up that material. So you need something to hold the fabric or the plastic down as well. You know, if you're putting this over the top, you need something to hold that down so it doesn't just blow away. And if you, and, and they will need to be vented. So this is where it can get tricky. And this is where a design like this comes in handy where you can just like lift it up or like prop it up a little bit. Because if we have a nice sunny day, um, it can get real hot in there, even if, it, even if it's pretty cold outside and you don't want your plants to roast. And I will say there's always, always a week in February where it gets crazy warm and people are like, oh my gosh, spring is here and it's never here. Um, and so in that week, your plants will fry in that low tunnel if you're, not, um, if you're not ventilating it, if you're not either taking the plastic off or propping it up in some way to, to let air flow in so it doesn't get overly hot inside uh, that low tunnel. If you do this, this can increase your temperatures by two to eight degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it's best to use it in combination with mulch because uh, like I said, you should be mulching everything. Doing this on top is just gonna um, make it even better. And it is the best protection if you have large areas or whole beds. Um, low tunnels are really kind of the cheapest, most effective way to, um, to protect kind of larger substantial areas. You know, if you're just wanting to protect a couple little plants, you, a low tunnel is probably not the most efficient. But if you're wanting to do a whole bed or a big long row of something, do a low tunnel. So to build a low tunnel, or you know, what do they look like? Uh, you're gonna need hoops. So you're gonna need something to hold up the fabric or the plastic. So you can use just like stiff wire. Like if you get wire and you just kind of bend it into a hoop, you can also get pre-bent wires. So things that are already bent into a nice um, kind of half circle hoop for you, um, which is nice. Uh, if you're wanting to do a bigger one, like one that, that's taller or wider, you can also use metal conduit, like that you go buy at a hardware store. That's what they use to, to put um, like electrical wires through. Uh, and you can get like a pipe bender, um, or if you know somebody who has a pipe bender, and you can bend it into whatever shape you want so that you can make a really tall low tunnel, which for winter gardening can be really nice because generally 
again, if you're growing your plants all the way to maturity, they might be kind of tall for some of these shorter um, kind of low tunnels that are more common. Uh, so metal conduit can be nice, uh, or you can use half inch PVC pipe, which is much cheaper um, and it just you know bends on its own. It doesn't last as long as a metal conduit or, uh, or a wire, um, but they can be, can be nice. And that's you know, what you see in this picture over here on the right. You will then also need um, the material to cover, you know, to, to put over the hoops, like the, the material is the whole point. So there's stuff that's called row cover. It's also called frost blanket, which is like a, a woven or not woven. It's like a, a spun kind of synthetic material that looks uh, a lot like a dryer sheet in its, in its consistency. <clears throat> and then there's also plastic. So, you know, just like a greenhouse type plastic. Uh, there's plastic like this and this picture. So this is the type of plastic that we use that has, you can, it's kind of hard to see on here, but those little dots, those are holes, like pre-punched holes in the plastic. Uh, and what's nice about that is that that means that you do not have to vent it because that those holes um, ventilate it enough for you on those hot days. So it's nice if you have a garden that, that's not, especially if it's not like in your backyard and it's, you know, a little more difficult for you to, to go out in the morning and open it up and close it at night if it's a sunny day. And then, like I said, you're gonna need something to secure that material down to actually like hold it in place over those hoops. So you can get sod staples, which are just like little kind of U-shaped um, wires that you just push into the ground through the edge of the plastic to hold it down. You can also just weight it down with things like brick or rock or lumber. You know, you've got a big long side, you can just put like a two by four along the edge of the plastic on the ground to hold it down. Um, just anything that will hold it in place is fine. And I always also like to point out that you can do extra insulation. So, you know, if you, you know, have plastic over this, um, you, you can add more, like you don't need to just do one layer. Um, if it's something that's really fragile or if all you can find is row cover, but the row cover isn't gonna provide enough protection for what you want to do, do two layers of row cover. Um, and, and doing two actually does give you more protection because it creates, you know, a little air pocket between those two layers. And that air pocket is insulation. That's really all insulation is. It's just isolated air pockets. You know, it's why like coats that are warm tend to be kind of fluffy. It's because the, that fluffiness is the insulation. It's all those air pockets in there that, that gives you the insulation. Um, or like, you know, when you insulate a house, it's like spray foam is like the, you know, really expensive best stuff. Well, it's foam because the foam has air bubbles in it <laughs> that are that are sealed in place. And so it acts as insulation. It's actually the those air pockets that act as insulation. So if you do two layers or three layers, or if you do a layer of row cover and a layer of plastic on top of it, um, that, that's gonna add to the heat protection. Um, I like to point out, you know, it's kind of the difference between row cover and plastic and how they can kind of work together in some instances is that plastic allows more heat in because it's because it's clear. So all the, you know, infrared radiation can come in um, and, and produce heat in that space. And then it's trapped because usually the plastic is um, is solid. You know, if you have the vent holes, it's going to let some of the heat out. But if it's solid, you know, the heat can't get back out. The light comes in, it changes, and it can't, it doesn't have enough wavelength to really come back out of that plastic. And so it traps it. That's the greenhouse effect. <clears throat> Whereas row cover, because it's that spun material, kind of like a dryer sheet, there, there, there are holes in it. It does breathe. And it's a little bit more opaque. And so it doesn't allow as much heat in, but because it is spun and it's got some air pockets in it, Whereas, you know, plastic has nothing. It's just a sheet of plastic because that row does have like, you know, a little bit of texture to it. It's better at insulating. So it can't let as much heat in, but it prevents more heat from leaving at night because it's, because it's a layer of insulation. So if it's, so if it's really cold, you're trying to keep something really warm, doing a, a layer of row cover, which is insulating, and then plastic over top is actually gonna keep you quite a bit warmer than either one on its own. And you can also, you know, do temporary extra, you know, insulation. So if you have, um, you know, a really cold night that's coming, like I'm thinking like two, was it two winters ago where it was pretty warm all winter long, like we didn't really cover anything. And then we had that like week in February where it was like below zero, like the whole week. And so we put some plastic over the beds and then we just threw like a whole bunch of extra, 
you know, covers over there. Because for a couple days, it doesn't really matter. It's gonna block the light. So you don't wanna leave it on all the time. But if it's just for like a couple days or a week to keep thing, to get things through an unusually cold snap, there's no problem doing that. Even to the point where you can see with this one where, you know, it's a cover and they put like an unzipped sleeping bag over top which is going to provide a lot of insulation if you have a really cold night. But again, you don't want to leave that on for four months or your plants are just going to die because there's no light that they can get. And then there's cold frames. So cold frames are, um, it are solid walls with a glass or translucent plastic roof on them. Uh, they offer the most protection. Um, so more than mulch or low tunnels, they must be vented because they can get really hot, really, really hot in there. So the same thing as low tunnels, you wanna make sure uh, that it gets opened if it's a sunny day or if it's a warm day um, and then closed before nighttime to keep them warmer. Uh, they need to face south or, or like, you know, straight up and down or south. If it's slanted, you don't want that slant to be facing the north because then they're not gonna get any heat into them because the sun is low in the sky in the southern, the southern horizon in the winter. They tend to look nicer, but are much more expensive and more work to build than a low tunnel. Um, movable ones, like ones that you can like move around and stick on your beds or over individual plants, um, tend to be small because they're heavy. Like you can't, like having a really big one would be really heavy. And so because they're small, it tends to limit their, their applications. Um, larger ones uh, are nice because you can grow a lot more things in them, but they tend to be permanent because they're really heavy. And so they've got kind of some limitations. You can build ones, like temporary ones, but they don't usually look as nice. So this is an example you where know, you can like stack straw bales around and then just put some old windows on top. So you can just put that over your bed and it'll work. It's just not going to look as nice, but you know, if you don't care about that, then who cares? And then there's other frost protections. So those are, you know, specific things that I was kind of talking about, but there's many other designs online of products that you can buy or build yourself to protect crops from cold. They're all basically the same idea. Um, they just have different shapes or slightly different things. Um, and as far as I've seen, they, they pretty much all work similarly. Um, so, you know, you can try other things as well. So then overwintering crops. Now we're running out of time here. Um, so overwintering crops are different than winter crops. They're less work than winter crops because they don't need winter protection. So overwintering crops um, are generally planted in mid-October. So, you know, this is not stuff that you're going to be planting right now. This is stuff to like file away to remember that you're going to be planting them in mid-October. And then you, they're being harvested usually in June. Um, almost all of them ripen around June, maybe into July, depending on how the, the spring goes. And the crops kind of fall into three main categories. So there's alliums, which is like the onion family. There's some grains and there's some pulses, which are like dried beans, peas, things like that, that you can grow as, as true overwintering crops where you're you know, planting them and they just do their thing without any protection. So winter alliums. So these are crops like garlic, elephant garlic, walking onions, shallots, and potato onions. Um, so I'm gonna talk about each one of these but some, some similarities. So the onion family in general, and these are no exception, are very heavy nitrogen feeders. And so um, it's helpful to add compost before you plant um, because that compost is gonna, is gonna help feed them through the winter. It also helps um, prevent the soil from, from being waterlogged because compost is nice and fluffy and it acts to kind of hold on to water like a sponge. Um, and they also, they do not compete well with weeds. They tend to be just kind of upright, skinny things. They don't cast a lot of shade. And so there's lots of open space between them where you can get lots of weeds. And so you want to weed often if you see weeds, although there's fewer weeds in the winter. And then again, mulch them. If you mulch them in the winter, you're not going to get anywhere near as many weeds and they're going to grow much, um, much more happily for you. And this is a picture up here of garlic. And this is what it should look like. It should be thick mulch around these individual garlic plants and no weeds and they will be happy. So garlic, um, so there's a couple different types of garlic. There's hardneck. So hardneck garlic uh, is the garlic that produces a scape. So scapes are these curly Q kind of things that come out of, of hardneck garlic um, and they should be removed. So when they look like this, you wanna pop them off or cut them off, or you can, you can also kind of pull them off. Um, I think we did a little video on our social media somewhere that you can find showing kind of the benefit of pulling them as opposed to cutting them. 
but do it however you want. But removing it, they, there's been studies on like big commercial farms that have found that removing the scapes can actually increase your yield by 25 to 30% because the energy is instead going to the bulb. Um, in, instead of going to the scape, it's going to the bulb. Hard neck garlic, usually like if you cut it, you know, horizontally across the bulb, you're going to see this like woody stem in the middle. That's the scape coming up from the very base of the plant. And then there'll be one ring of cloves around it. Soft neck garlic um, does not produce a scape. Um, and so if you like braided garlic, it's much easier to do because the stems are, are nice and soft. The neck is soft, hence soft neck. And they, you know, so they do not have this center thing there. And they tend to have two or more rings of cloves. There tends to be a lot more cloves in terms of numbers, but the cloves tend to be smaller. So like the, the bulbs are about the same size between hard neck and soft neck. The cloves are just different size. And then there's elephant garlic. So elephant garlic is actually not a garlic. Um, oh, and I did like to, to point out too that soft neck garlic is milder in flavor. Uh, hard neck garlic is a really pungent garlic. So if you really like garlic flavor, grow hard neck garlic. Um, if you like the garlic that you like buy at the grocery store, buy soft neck garlic because that's what they sell at the grocery store. Um, elephant garlic is actually not a garlic, but is actually a subspecies of leek. Uh, it, but it produces a scape like hard neck garlic, but that scape tends to get tough very quickly. And so it's usually not as good flavored as scapes. So like hard neck garlic scapes you can eat and they're really, really good. Um, but, you, but you should still break off the scape of elephant garlic um, unless you really want the flowers. The flowers are gorgeous. That's what these pictures down here are. If you want the flowers, let them flower. <clears throat> And the bulbs, the reason why they're called elephant garlic is that the bulbs on them can get absolutely enormous, uh, but it's a very mild garlic. Like you can almost use it more as like a vegetable than a spice because they're very, very mild, but it does have a garlicky flavor just like hard neck or soft neck garlic would. I also like to point out too that you don't have to wait for the bulb to mature all the way. You can also harvest what's called like green garlic. Um, which is, you know, in the spring before they're ready to be harvested for the bulb, if you just pull it out, the, it, it, it's kind of like the equivalent of like a green onion, um, except it'll be a green leek and you can chop it up and eat the whole thing and it's going to taste garlicky, just like a green onion tastes like a bulb onion. And then with um, elephant garlic, because it is a leek, you can also grow it as a perennial leek, like instead of digging it out, if you cut the greens off, you got a leek and then you let it grow back and kind of do its thing. Um, and it's a pretty nice way to get, um, to get leeks. <clears throat> so all three of these, you're gonna, the, they have the same signals of when to harvest. So when the bottom two leaves are dead, like they turn brown and shrivel up and kind of that third one is starting, is like turning yellow, that's when you wanna dig it up and you dig the whole thing up. So then there's shallots and potato onions. So these are very similar to each other and grow exactly the same, like when to plant, when to harvest, all those things are the same. The main difference is the shape of the bulb uh, and the taste. So the shape of shallots is, you know, if you've seen shallots, you know, it's kind of like more of a teardrop shape or a little bit more elongated. Um, whereas a potato onion, it just looks like a little onion. It, you know, it looks, it's got that much more round shape of a classic onion. Potato onions taste like onions. They're a little bit more, um, they're more pungent than a, than a standard onion, <clears throat> but, they, but they have that same onion taste, whereas shallots have a more unique um, flavor to them. For both of these, you harvest when the tops flop over. Um, so you can see in this picture here where they're kind of flopping on the ground. Um, so the leaves are not all brown. You don't want to wait for that, especially with shallots. Um, if you wait till everything is totally brown and dead with shallots, the shallots have probably rotted in the ground. They're very sensitive to rot. Um, so when they when they flop over on the ground, um, and and you'll you'll tell because like if you take it, you know you try and like stand it up, it's just like flexible. It's like there's a hinge on it. So that's when you know it's time to harvest for both the potato onions and the shallots. So the harvesting um, process and then curing, which is how you you kind of dry them and get them ready for storage is the same for hard neck, soft neck, and elephant garlic and shallots and potato onions. So you want to carefully dig up the bulbs um, so that you're not cutting into the bulb, which you'd think like, oh, like it's pretty easy not to cut into it, but it's not. You will 
almost certainly cut into at least a few of them. So you want to be careful as you're digging them up. Um, and then once you dig them up, because they are still going to have green on them, like the, you know, I said, like for garlic, you know, at the bottom two to three leaves are brown, while well, the top ones are still green. And like I said, with the shallots and the potato onions, you know, they flopped over, but the leaves are still green. So you want to lay them out to dry. So, or you can hang them up in this picture, but you want to put them somewhere that is not in direct sun, that is not going to get rained on, but also has plenty of airflow. So usually somewhere outside, but in a protected area is usually the best. You can do it inside. Um, if you do it inside, it's usually best to have a fan blowing on them. Um, but like if you have a porch, porches are great. Porches are great places to cure garlic, onions, and shallots. Um, you let them sit there for about two or so weeks, um, at which point they're gonna be totally brown. All the energy from these leaves is gonna go into um, the bulbs and the outer skins of the bulbs are gonna dry and become papery. Uh, at that point, you can cut off all the top part that you don't want. If there's any dirt, you can kind of gently rub that dirt off. Uh, and then you want to store them in a cool, dry place, but ideally one that's also kind of humid, which helps um, slow them, slow the drying down. So not, so again, not a damp area, but a place that has a high humidity. So basements usually are like that, where you know, hopefully your basement isn't like wet, but it's probably pretty humid. So those are great places to store them. Um, and then walking onions. So this is the last kind of um, overwintering allium, but it's different. So these are also called Egyptian walking onions, tree onions, and top setting onions. They're actually a natural hybrid between bunching onions or scallions um, and shallots. So uh, you can actually plant these now, or you can wait until mid-October. They're very indestructible plants. You can plant them really kind of whenever you want. But uh, if you plant them now, you will get green onions, which is really the best, what they're best at. Um, you will get green onions this fall. And if you don't harvest them all, they'll go dormant during the coldest part of winter. And then in mid-February, they'll green up again and you'll have more, um, more green onions in the spring. If you wait until mid-October to plant them, then they're gonna grow a little bit, but they're gonna be too small to harvest until spring, at which point you will have green onions several weeks before you would get spring planted green onions. So this is one that I really love um, because they, they self-propagate. Um, but, uh, but a lot of people don't like it because if you don't, because they self-propagate. <laughs> so if you don't uh, manage them, they will take over. Um, but if they do that, just pull them out and eat them. They're delicious. They taste just like a green onion. So then great, there's just two more slides here. Um, so grains, uh, if you're interested in growing grains at all, which I find fun, um, winter wheat, winter barley, and winter rye are really the easiest ones to grow over winter here. Uh, so these are ones that you would plant mid-October, like October 15th, um, and then you harvest them generally mid-June to late June. Like, I mean, usually it wouldn't go into, into July, but usually, mid to late June at some, at some point. And you know it's ready because it turns straw colored because that's what straw is, is all the stuff left over from harvesting wheat. Um, barley and rye have a hard to remove hull. So unless you're like real into growing grains, um, don't do barley or rye. Um, if you get modern wheats, they all are free threshing. So what that means is like when you bang the grains off the, the straw, the hull just falls off. Um, and so you don't need to do more processing than that. Uh, but this is a picture of me harvesting some, some wheat and you can see, you know, it's, it's, it's not winter, you know, it's, it's June here, um, but that's just the cycle of, of the wheat. And then there's some pulses. So these are um, uh, legumes like the bean family. So if you like fava beans at all, uh, sweet Loran is one that I have found does um, does pretty well as something that you plant in late fall in like early, like the first half of October generally, and then you'll get fava beans in, in June. Uh, whereas planting fava beans in the spring can be hit or miss. Like this year, I, I actually ran into several people that their fava beans did well, but I think that was mostly because our spring was so long and cool, which is a bit unusual. Um, but most years it gets too hot and they don't really do real well. But the overwintered ones uh, I found do pretty well. 
You can also actually grow lentils here as an overwintering crop. Morton lentil is the is the the variety that I found does the best. And again, that's one that you would plant kind of the first half to or to mid October, and then it will overwinter, and then you'll get lentils in um, in June. And then there's grain peas. If you want to grow like the soup peas, like split pea soup kind of peas, um, Austrian winter. Um, usually does okay, but if you can get a hold of Blaze or Lynx, which were um, varieties that were bred for uh, Eastern Washington State, uh, those do do really well. Um, Austrian winter pea does well most years, but sometimes it's a little too cold for it, but Blaze and Lynx uh, do really well. And that is it for uh, winter gardening and overwintering crops. Uh, this here is just uh, our upcoming classes. So thanks, everybody.